Section 18 of The Essence of Christianity by Ludwig Feuerbach. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Essence of Christianity by Ludwig Feuerbach. Translated from the German by Marian Evans. Chapter 14 The Mystery of the Resurrection and of the miraculous conception the quality of being agreeable to subjective inclination belongs not only to practical miracles in which it is conspicuous as they have immediate reference to the interest or wish of the human individual it belongs also to theoretical or more properly dogmatic miracles and hence to the resurrection and the miraculous conception man at least in a state of ordinary well-being has the wish not to die this wish is originally identical with the instinct of self-preservation whatever lives seeks to maintain itself to continue alive and consequently not to die subsequently when the reflection and feeling are developed under the urgency of life especially of social and political life this primary negative wish becomes the positive wish for a life and that a better life after death but this wish involves a further wish for the certainty of its fulfillment reason can afford no such certainty it has therefore been said that all proofs of immortality are insufficient and even that unassisted reason is not capable of apprehending it still less of proving it and with justice for reason furnishes only general proofs it cannot give this certainty of any personal immortality and it is precisely this certainty which is desired such a certainty requires an immediate personal assurance a practical demonstration this can only be given to me by the fact of a dead person whose death has been previously certified rising again from the grave and he must be no indifferent person but on the contrary the type and representative of all others so that his resurrection also may be the type the guarantee of theirs the resurrection of christ is therefore the satisfied desire of man for an immediate certainty of his personal existence after death personal immortality as a sensible indubitable fact immortality was with the heathen philosophers a question in which the personal interest was only a collateral point they concerned themselves chiefly with the nature of the soul of mind of the vital principle the immortality of the vital principle by no means involves the idea and not to mention the certainty of personal immortality hence the vagueness discrepancy and dubiousness with which the ancients express themselves on this subject the christians on the contrary in the undoubting certainty that their personal self-flattering wishes will be fulfilled i e in the certainty of the divine nature of their emotions the truth and unassailableness of their subjective feelings converted that which to the ancients was a theoretic problem into an immediate fact converted a theoretic and in itself open question into a matter of conscience the denial of which was equivalent to the high treason of atheism he who denies the resurrection denies the resurrection of christ but he who denies the resurrection of christ denies christ himself and he who denies christ denies god thus did the spiritual christianity unspiritualize what was spiritual to the christians the immortality of the reason of the soul was far too abstract and negative and they had at heart only a personal immortality such as would gratify their feelings and the guarantee of this lies in the bodily resurrection alone the resurrection of the body is the highest triumph of christianity over the sublime 
but certainly abstract spirituality and objectivity of the ancients for this reason the idea of the resurrection could never be assimilated by the pagan mind as the resurrection which terminates the sacred history to the christian not a mere history but the truth itself is a realized wish so also is that which commences it namely the miraculous conception though this has relation not so much to an immediately personal interest as to a particular subjective feeling the more man alienates himself from nature the more subjective i e supranatural or antinatural is his view of things the greater the horror he has of nature or at least of those natural objects and processes which displease his imagination which affect him disagreeably the free objective man doubtless finds things repugnant and distasteful in nature but he regards them as natural inevitable results and under this conviction he subdues his feeling as a merely subjective and untrue one on the contrary the subjective man who lives only in the feelings and imagination regards these things with a quite peculiar aversion he has the eye of that unhappy foundling who even in looking at the loveliest flower could pay attention only to the little black beetle which crawled over it and who by this perversity of perception had his enjoyment in the sight of flowers always embittered moreover the subjective man makes his feelings the measure the standard of what ought to be that which does not please him which offends his transcendental supranatural or antinatural feelings ought not to be even if that which pleases him cannot exist without being associated with that which displeases him the subjective man is not guided by the wearisome laws of logic and physics but by the self-will of the imagination hence he drops what is disagreeable in a fact and holds fast alone what is agreeable thus the idea of the pure holy virgin pleases him still he is also pleased with the idea of the mother but only of the mother who already carries the infant on her arms virginity in itself is to him the highest moral ideal the cornucopia of his supranaturalistic feelings and ideas his personified sense of honor and of shame before common nature nevertheless there stirs in his bosom a natural feeling also the compassionate feeling which makes the mother beloved what then is to be done in this difficulty of the heart in this conflict between a natural and a supernatural feeling the supernaturalist must unite the two must comprise in one and the same subject two predicates which exclude each other oh what a plentitude of agreeable sweet supersensual sensual emotions lie in this combination here we have the key to the contradiction in catholicism that at the same time marriage is holy and celibacy is holy this simply realizes as a practical contradiction the dogmatic contradiction of the virgin mother but this wondrous union of virginity and maternity contradicting nature and reason but in the highest degree accordant with the feelings and imagination is no product of catholicism it lies already in the twofold part which marriage plays in the bible especially in the view of the apostle paul the supernatural conception of christ is a fundamental doctrine of christianity a doctrine which expresses its inmost dogmatic essence and which rests on the same foundation as all other miracles and articles of faith as death which the philosopher the man of science the free objective thinker in general accepts as a natural necessity and as indeed all the limits of nature which are impediments to feeling but to reason are rational laws were repugnant to christians and were set aside by them through the supposed agency of miraculous power 
so necessarily they had an equal repugnance to the natural process of generation and superseded it by miracle the miraculous conception is not less welcome than the resurrection to all believers for it was the first step towards the purification of mankind polluted by sin and nature only because the god-man was not infected with original sin could he the pure one purify mankind in the eyes of god to whom the natural process of generation was an object of aversion because he himself is nothing else but supernatural feeling even the arid protestant orthodoxy so arbitrary in its criticism regarded the conception of the god-producing virgin as a great adorable amazing holy mystery of faith transcending reason but with the protestants who confined the specialty of the christian to the domain of faith and with whom in life it was allowable to be a man even this mystery had only a dogmatic and no longer a practical significance they did not allow it to interfere with their desire of marriage with the catholics and with all the old uncompromising uncritical christians that which was a mystery of faith was a mystery of life of morality catholic morality is christian mystical protestant morality was in its very beginning rationalistic protestant morality is and was a carnal mingling of the christian with the man the natural political civil social man or whatever else he may be called in distinction from the christian catholic morality cherished in its heart the mystery of the unspotted virginity catholic morality was a mater dolorosa protestant morality a comely fruitful matron protestantism is from the beginning to end the contradiction between faith and love for which very reason it has been the source or at least the condition of freedom just because the mystery of the virgo de para had with the protestants a place only in theory or rather in dogma and no longer in practice they declared that it was impossible to express oneself with sufficient care and reserve concerning it and that it ought not to be made an object of speculation that which is denied in practice has no true basis and durability in man is a mere specter of the mind and hence it is withdrawn from the investigation of the understanding ghosts do not brook daylight even the later doctrine which however had been already enunciated in a letter to saint bernard who rejects it that mary herself was conceived without taint of original sin is by no means a strange school-bred doctrine as it is called by a modern historian that which gives birth to a miracle which brings forth god must itself be of miraculous divine origin or nature how could mary have had the honor of being overshadowed by the holy ghost if she had not been from the first pure could the holy ghost take up his abode in a body polluted by original sin if the principle of christianity the miraculous birth of the saviour does not appear strange to you why think strange the naive well-meaning inferences of catholicism End of section 18